I think I'd like to try something before I start. Um, my phone's busy right now driving my presentation, so I can't text, but I like to order a flow out coffee. And all you guys have, if you want to order a flow out coffee, look at that little sticker. You, there's a little location, and you can text, and uh, they'll bring it right to you. Or they're out there in the back. I think that's kind of cool. Okay, so uh, as my uh, daughter said, I'm Anthony Minasali, and I'm here to talk about free switch and to welcome everyone to KUKAN. Um, but first, I'd like to uh, ask how you think about the internet. Most of the time at conferences, the internet's pretty bad, right? So for the first time, we've had like pretty much the fastest internet I've ever seen at any of the 12 KUKANs. And if you heard Adam after lunch and going through the rest of the conference, we'll have a full gigabit going into this room. So I'd like to give a big hand to Windstream for providing something like that. It's never been possible in the last 12 years. Okay, so I want to start talking a little bit about free switch. I don't know how many people here are familiar with it. I know you might have heard about KuCon from free switch, or maybe you didn't. So I'm not going to make assumptions. It's going to kind of just give a generalization of what free switch is and some of the other things you can do. And look at that. That's magic. <laughs> I'm going to try some. Oh, it's delicious. Okay, so. FreeSwitch is a core communication software daemon written mostly in C. Um, it is capable of being uh, ancillary C++, but mostly in C because we're pretty much a C team and that's what we do best. So um, it also has a collection of modules around that, which are written in C and or C++, and that helps to extend the functionality uh, to other parts of the computer. So. Um, that's kind of like a 10,000 foot understanding of what it is. It's these three things, uh, including also a large collection of dependencies. Uh, when we started the project, one of our goals was not to waste time trying to solve problems that already were solved. So we wanted to use as many other existing open source uh, things that were available to us. Uh, so we do our best to evaluate. Uh, whenever we want to solve a new problem, the first thing we do is go look and see, like, is there something doing this already? Is there a library that suits our needs that was already made just for what we want instead of trying to invent it ourselves? So we have a pretty decent size uh, number of dependencies. Uh, the core has uh, dependencies of its own, and some of the modules have also dependencies, uh, which makes it possible for modules to exist in different environments. Since we do run on all platforms, for instance, you could make a Windows-only module that can't be used in Linux and vice versa. But the core is compatible on all the platforms, so it gives you kind of a, a extensibility path. So what does FreeSwitch do? Um, it interconnects communication protocols. Um, that's probably the most generic and widespread use of FreeSwitch. Um, it also serves as a media engine and backend for applications. Um, there's a lot of IVRs written on it. Um, things that probably in the past would have cost maybe $25,000 an instance to have about five or ten calls at once on it are now things you can just make yourself, um, not just with free switch, but Asterix. And we've got some guys here from Asterix, and you'll hear about that too. Um, we really have a really close relationship, uh, common past. Um, you can route calls and optionally try and code media formats, which is uh, something everyone likes to avoid because it costs a lot of uh, CPU resources, but it's a necessary evil. And as more codecs are developed, um, we work on trying to make those available. Um, we provide conferencing and NCU functionality, one of our more popular features. Um, lots of different online uh, you know, meeting software and and those kinds of things uh, leverage some of our functionality for years. So um, you can also do whatever you can make it do. Uh, we try to make it in as small pieces as possible so that when you want to solve a problem that you can utilize the various things that we have at your disposal to build something. So we try not to build, free switch isn't a product, it's a project. So. It's purposely apart. Like what Brian loves to call it a Lego set. 
and we always joke that we don't want to glue the bricks together so everything's there for you guys to kind of we show you what to do in our demonstration version but it's really uh, extensible as far as you want um, so some of the parts of free switch uh, in the main core um, this is kind of a generic things I thought were the most popular f uh, resources you can get from the free switch core First of all, there's Nextmel registry, and I know everybody is always like, I hear, the, I always search to see what people think of FreeSwitch, and there's always this like group of people that are like, oh, XML, FreeSwitch uses XML, and it's impossible to use unless I understand. But we hate XML, so just think if we were using XML and we hate it, we probably used it as minimally as possible. Like actual XML fans hate us even more because they're like, you are using XML wrong. You know, basically when we started the project, uh, JSON was kind of like a wink in someone's eyes still. So, you know, XML was the way to do machine readable stuff. And it's kind of the perfect balance between something that you can actually read and you can edit and the machine can fast parse it. And uh, that's actually provided a lot of uh, positive side effects we've had. Uh, we have a pretty big um, community of people that with impairments, and for instance, our XML format, it was really easy for blind people to be able to use FreeSwitch. And uh, we didn't actually plan for that, but it came out as like a surprise when we had lots of people like, oh, your config file format's the only kind of like software I can actually read, because I have to plug it into a machine to read it for me and whatnot, and it makes it easier for those people. So it's kind of like, we just use it for that, and we don't use it for, we don't go crazy and dig deep into like XML culture and like make you follow a bunch of rules. It's really kind of very loose XML. Okay, so we also have an event system, and really one of our goals in the project is to try and like describe everything that's happening at all times with events so that when you're trying to use you know, make your external application that you can look at those events to tell things that are happening. Uh, we want to design it so that the software was agnostic from what people wanted to use it for. So it would just basically chats about everything it's doing really, really loudly. And you can pick which things you want to know about. And that kind of helps you internally or externally because we have, we have like a, uh, just a common format with the events that you can, so if you're in a C module, you can subscribe to those events in C and you'll get callbacks and it's really fast and you can do what you want with them. And if you're doing something external, like you're having a remote connection or something where you're connecting over a socket and getting the events that way, um, you can, it's still the kind of the same thing, only maybe a little less performant because we're dumping the events over the wire to you, but nonetheless, you can still react to them. So you, it kind of gives you the most flexibility uh, there's event hooks. I think that's something that I'll get into a little more uh, later, but this is something that most people don't even know is there. And we've had a lot of functionality built in since the beginning that kind of came into more use later. And uh, some people don't even have to mess with anything when they use FreeSwitch. They just kind of take our stock demo and kind of tweak it to their needs. But really, there's like some deeper stuff. I'm going to just go over some of the interfaces in a minute so that you can know about them better. Um, so we have language modules, which is a uh, way to take uh, scripting languages and whatnot that people like to develop stuff in for rapid development. And those language modules allow you to like, say use Perl, or we have uh, JavaScript and various other languages that you can write IVRs in, which makes it easy to deploy and change stuff. Um, We've also got uh, phrase macros, which is a um, kind of something we came up with for IVRs so that um, for language independence and, and concept, it kind of separates a concept from like how it's conveyed. So like for instance, a good example is our, our voicemail module uses them so that it can switch languages really easily because it, the phrase macro will just be like, 
you can create a phrase macro by name and register it. And, um, this is like all using basically just like a XML file that says, you know, like uh, uh, announce number of messages. You just make up some word. It's it's kind of intuitive to a programming function, but it's uh, through text. Um, so when you call the phrase macro, like get number, or, like tell people number of messages, it'll uh, look at the language and you can have it play certain files to describe like you have seven messages and then that could be you can change like what happens when that macro is called like from the configuration and our entire voicemail is written that way so if anyone's interested you can like play around in there and look at how we do it um, then we also have uh, our CUtils which is basically onboard functions that if you're writing modules in FreeSwitch, you have like most of the core of FreeSwitch and all of its resources in front of you. So you, uh, we have a whole bunch of convenience functions and IVR things and just little pieces that you can use in your modules that are kind of like a toolkit that you can use that are geared towards uh, telephony type stuff. So then we have um, multi-dimensional CDRs is something that a lot of people really love. Um, they come in two varieties of XML and JSON. Uh, basically, after years of playing around with CDRs and having like uh, just basically a, like a CSV kind of thing, um, we realized that CDRs are like much more complicated than that. So our CDRs are implemented as an object rather than just a line. So we have, you know, will dump all the channel variables into a subsection. So when you look at our CDRs, um, you're really seeing kind of everything that ever happened during that call. Like every digit someone dialed, um, all the times that the RTP might have had a problem. There's just an endless supply of information. And it's too hard to convey as a single line. With, like a lot of CDRs, you just see like caller ID and like what time it was. And so if you look at, if you want to, check those out. We have, there's some examples on our wiki. And also, um, you can just go and make a call and enable one of the modules. And you can uh, just kind of look at it. Like, just make a call and do a bunch of stuff and look at them. And you'll see, like, all the different data you have to work with. Um, apart from that, we have a logging engine. Um, we're big on logging. Some people get annoyed, but really, like, we need it, especially when you're going to report bugs to us. Uh, we log everything we do. Uh, we have pretty big. If you turn on the max logging and do a trace, it'll it'll be really big, and it looks like gibberish to a lot of people. But to us, that's really how we understand what happened. It's an audit of like everything that's going on. And if you write more modules, you can use that logging engine, you know, to add information about what you do. And when we're talking about modules. Um, that's basically its own category, and I wanted to start with this. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this picture before. We thought we'd, it showed up in our book, um, so I thought I would bring it back. I think this is kind of something we made in the first couple years. I think it might have been the second ClueCon, the first time anyone ever saw this picture. Um, it's kind of just a uh, generalization of like how we visualize free switch where the core is protected and these modules here kind of uh, orbit around it and then those types of modules in turn have like the, the gateway to different services that they provide so free switch module interfaces are they're designed to be used outside the core um, we try and make it so that when you want to make a module that you don't have to have access to things that you could cause interference with the system and how it works. And we wanted to keep it simple. So there's an API kind of layered structure. So from a module standpoint, you, you don't really have access to many of the things directly. You have an API barrier between you and those core resources so that it kind of helps you do things right because by limiting the ways that you can touch stuff, it kind of steers you in the right direction. Um, and the purpose of modules are to help you uh, extend your functionality. Um, if anyone's ever used Asterisk, there's modules there or Apache, um, both influences on us. Um, 
uh, it's a standard method of taking extending software by building a shared object that you load at the runtime, and it gives you an ability to do to just anything that you already have that you can write and see, you can fuse it together um, and make it possible to access it from inside of our software. So it's really meant to be an extension of the environment. Uh, we're heavily uh, influenced by Unix, um, the Unix way of doing things. So we have things that fit inside each other and try to extend our environment based on what's around us. So that's kind of a rundown of what modules are. And I'm going to go over some of the ways that modules can interface with FreeSwitch. Um, one of them is the endpoint, which is a pretty popular one. Um, they, they normally implement a communication protocol um, that fits the paradigm of what's known as the call. Uh, we talk about separate TDM. Um, if that line is getting really blurred now, you know, these days with all the other stuff you can do. So, but, you know, make a cell phone call the way you think of it. When you use the word call, generally, if you're going to hit the right thing, that's what an endpoint is. Um, large SIP endpoint is for making interfaces to SIP trunking and you make calls over it. So, um, if that's if you have some new protocol that enables the communication between some other device, then you would want to be making an endpoint. Um, and you know that's where most of the things go that are associated with uh, making calls and receiving calls. So like on SIP, the module for Mod Sophia will pull in subscriptions to presence and registration and all that kind of stuff. So that's what endpoints are for. Um, now we have the dial plan module. Um, that allows the module to basically pick up the number, the applications that ought to run when it hits the system. Um, so kind of the, the general gist of how things work with FreeSwitch is if you get a new inbound call, uh, you look at all the data that you have. Uh, we have a whole bunch of things that we collect immediately when there's a new call and pass it to a dial plan module. And that dial plan module has access to all that stuff. So you can pretty much look at any of that information and then all you have to do is provide it with a list of uh, applications to execute, and they'll just execute in order unless the call hangs up, and which will stop somewhere in the middle. So we have a XML dial plan, and anyone that's used research before, that's the default one. Um, I think it's misunderstood by a lot that that's the only way you can do it. But really, the XML dial plan that you see in FreeSwitch, if you try it right out of the box, is only an example of how dial plans work. Um, you could basically write your own module and see that you could set as your dial plan. You give it a name when you register it, and that name can go in your configuration. Like on Mod Sophia, you can make all your SIP calls go to your dial plan that you just wrote called My Dial Plan Mod. And in there, you could you can do whatever you want, really. You can look at you can just make everything happen the same every time and always call Rickroll or something, or you can inspect the channel. Um, it's like the number that someone dialed isn't the only thing you're limited to. You can really uh, dig through there and you know use the remote address or just any crazy thing, the via header from the SIP. I mean, whatever you want to use, you can help you decide what you want to do. And the XML dial plan just happens to expose all that stuff. And something you can just edit really quickly, so that's why it's popular. And we already have an XML registry going on in FreeSwitch, which is like a large XML document that we load when we first start, and it stays in memory. So you can go into there and and parse things. And using the markup, you can pick, you know, like if the caller ID is someone you don't like, uh, screaming monkeys and hang up or whatever you want to do, just kind of common stuff like that. So. Dial plan modules are powerful, but very seldomly used, I think, because we don't hear much about it. But we have a lot of people just using our default for that one. Uh, and then we have the file interface. And the file interface is basically a uh, what it sounds like, a media file interface, so that, say, you want to play audio files or video files or both at once. Uh, the modules can register to be able to read or write and they're not limited to that. Um, sometimes they can only do one or the other. Sometimes they do both. And we can also do streams. Um, 
We have like Mod Shout, for instance, that can connect to an IceCast server and uh, play that back. You want to have your music on hold come from IceCast or something like that. Or we have Mod Local Stream, which is like a uh, it's a module that runs in the background and just continuously plays files, kind of like a, a music loop, so that your music keeps going on even when nobody's there. And you can hook into that stream and you can have many listeners at once all simultaneously hearing that same broadcast. So there's lots of different things you can do with the file interface as well. Um, some th the file interface is stackable, so some modules have, uh, we have like a file string module where you can glue together a bunch of audio files and make it seem like one file handle. So there's a lot of fun things you can do with that too. Um, there's ASR TTS, which is speech recognition and text to speech. Um, we have that for a really long time. I'm kind of the most popular ones because they're free and built in. Uh, it's Festival Light and Pocket Sphinx, um, both from CMU for a really long time. Kind of 90% of things that you'll encounter are based on that in some way, but the open source and portable versions are uh, existing as free switch modules. Um, we have also, uh, I think we have um, MRCP which will let you do remote uh, ASR and TTS to like a commercial service or another daemon that you might want to write if your architecture is so heavy that you don't want to run that text generation or detection in your process. Uh, you can defer it over to another um, black box service and, and use that. The SAY interface is pretty similar to any IVR you've called. Uh, not so much lately. Nowadays, you have like smarter IVRs that try and act like humans and stuff, but those generic ones that you, everyone knows where it's basically just taking, loading an audio file for every one of the things, like it's reading back a number to you and like it's really just popping up, a, there's a file that says every different number and it glues it together and kind of sounds like someone's talking, but it's obviously got a bunch of spaces in it and that's still very popular. Um, it's especially useful for uh, language stuff um, because you, we have the same module in several languages and you can write another one if it doesn't exist already. So it's just a bunch of generic concepts that we can map uh, to a string of audio files. And then that's kind of a quick win for a lot of people who just want to be able to make IVRs and don't want to play around with uh, incomplete, you know, fancier stuff that we're still trying to perfect. Um, there's the chat interface. Um, in the chat interface, it's just like it sounds, it's for sending text messaging back and forth. Um, we've got kind of lots of ways to do it. Um, we Maybe about four years ago, we started gatewaying our chat interface with SMS. And now this year we have, with Floorout's new uh, SMS that allows you to order the coffee. Um, we've got a module for that. So you can go home and make your own IVRs that do cool stuff with their service. Um, and we also have mod SMPP if you want to go directly to a service provider that has that, uh, which there are several out there. Um, and then if you had some new kind of way of expressing chat, you know, through messaging, you could just write another module that interacts with it and. It gives you the ability to add more. Like if you make another endpoint, sometimes it also comes with chat. Like SIP has SIP simple, and it also uses the chat interface as well as the endpoint at the same time. Then we have management. Um, management really doesn't, even though it's a module, we don't really have that many plugins for it. We have SNMP module, and our management interface kind of looks just like SNMP. And it was trying to stay abstract in case there was like a competitor. You wanted to write your own that fits the bill that might use like a database or something or or something like that. So that's a not a lot of different modules under that category, but there is an SNMP one. Interesting. Let's see, we had a there we go. The limit module interface, um, that's basically used to take arbitrary concepts 
uh, that we can't predict and allow you to limit how many of those arbitrary concepts can exist simultaneously. So uh, the first thing it was used for was uh, limiting simultaneous calls to a certain extension or something like that. But it's really hard to know what you want to limit. So we just have a, an abstraction where you, it's a context and a object that you provide kind of like the path to a file on a file system and you say I want to limit, you run the limit app, you know, before and after use of a resource um, and it will keep track. So say like this user can only make two calls because we're trying to build the server side of this and he is only paying for two simultaneous calls so that you can figure out a way to make it fail if he tries making three calls at once. So we'll go through and, and the limit will keep track of it. Um, and we start out, we have a built-in one we originally did using the onboard database stuff on FreeSwitch. And somewhere along the way, it's been a lot of years now, five years ago or something, we expanded it so it could be a module. And we have uh, Redis and MongoDB as examples that you can, so you can share it. So you have more than one machine and you want to spread the limit across it. Um, the API was portable over a network that way then. And it's uh, kind of a tricky problem because trying to limit the stuff, trying to limit the resource consumption can lead to even more resource consumption, which in turn makes it harder to manage. So this module kind of does its best to, uh, to allow you to pull that off. Okay, we have also the directory interface. Um, the directory interface was kind of a, something we had for a really long time that never really kind of materialized into much, but it's still there. So I'm just gonna talk about it anyway. Um, we kind of uh, saw a possibility for using LDAP for things for directory management and we didn't want to limit things to LDAP. Um, it's kind of ironic because LDAP itself was meant to be a temporary format to move data from one place to another. There wasn't going to catch on, but it kind of did. And but we didn't want it to be limited to it, so we kind of took the the outer layer of the API, what LDAP looks like from a usability standpoint, and made a generic interface to it. And then we made an LDAP module for that generic interface. And we've had it for a really long time, but it's kind of just not used at all. So I don't know if it's just because nobody knows about it or because it's just not popular, but we've had it and it's there, so I thought I would just go over it. We have the codec interface. That one is very popular. That's one of the ones we probably have the most modules. Um, it's a media coder and decoder pair. Um, not always, it could only do one or the other. Most of the time it does both. Um, and it's basically used to take a encoded audio on the wire from most VoIP calls and stuff like that and translate it to ro the raw format so it can then be moved in to another raw format. It'll go from one, one format to another um, for audio. So you want to do something like uh, you have ULA traffic and you want to convert it to GSM or you want to make it into Opus or anything like that. Um, we have the capability to translate between those formats. And if you don't need to, it, it won't do it unless it's necessary. So you can have it ready in the background, but you can pass the data through as the encoded format. But say you wanted to record the audio. Um, most of the time, or, or if you want to listen in on the audio or detect something happening in it, you have to translate it to an unencoded state. So that's what our codecs are for. So. Most people avoid transcoding, and that's only done when necessary. But all, uh, for when it comes to recording or doing other fancy things with the audio, like changing the volume or whatever, you have to be able to decode it first. So that's what codec modules are for. And there's, we pretty much, if there's one out there to do, we have it. Um, if it's available and there's no restriction for us to implement, uh, we usually rush to get it out there because we have, uh, we like to play around with codecs. It's fun. Um, we got Opus going like right after it was possible. Um, and Brian here is our resident codec guy. Like he usually finds out about him before everyone else. 
and brings them up and tries to get them uh, set up. So now application is also a very popular interface in free switch. Um, if anyone's used Asterix, it's not entirely unlike that same exact thing in application. Um, it's basically a direct like foreground communication function between you and your code and the session that's happening. So the, you call in an extension and it routes to the dial plan that I was talking about before. The dial plan could choose to, to run your application that you told it to by name. And then it'll, when that happens, the function is in the foreground and you have the channel at your mercy and you can read and write audio from it or a video or start threads or, especially when you write your module in C, you can pretty much um, do anything you want that we make available. Um, you can just do something like set a couple variables on the channel and leave again and silently, you know, just take a snap of a finger. Um, you can attach like background hooks to, to the channel. You can, you know, we have the bridge application. There's a mod DP tools in tree, which basically is like a giant collection of things that people do a lot. And it's full of applications that you can run. So any of the examples you might see on a free switch extension, um, all those things are applications. And there's just a very lot of them. And that's kind of like a very popular interface. OK, um, then we have the FS API. Um, the FS API is, if you want to think about the easiest way, if you've ever used the CLI commands in any software, it's kind of, that's how we implement ours. Um, it's very abstract. It takes text in and text out. So big blurb of text in, big blurb of text out. So you can basically feed, you can feed it whatever you want. A lot of times that's collected from a command line in, in like a CLI or something. And but it also could come like from other sources, but it it's just some blob of text. It could be JSON or whatever you want it to be, really. But most of the time, it's usually modeled after like Unix command line applications, where there's a list of arguments. Um, that's the most flexible because that usually that allows an API to be designed in a way that you can test it from a typing in a command line, but you can also access it through your program. Um, and similar function. So we, we usually default to that kind of interface just so that the f it's usable kind of from both directions at the same time. But it's not limited to that at all. You can make it really take anything you want in and anything back out. Um, it can also be run from the dial plan, uh, which is similar to the asterisk uh, function variables, which is no coincidence because uh, that was something that I invented back then when we used to work on Asterix. So kind of went different directions with it by now. Like I think it doesn't do quite the same anymore. But our, I, we just kind of reuse that concept at the same time with our API. So you can, in your dial plan, you can evaluate the API function with the arguments and expand the variables. And it can return text back that you can collect. And then. A good example of that is mod commands. That's kind of like the companion. Mod DP tools is full of applications, and mod commands is full of uh, FS API implementations. And like the show command you might type at the CLI or UID record. And uh, the mod conference actually has a command interface to manipulate things, like so you can uh, turn people's volume up and down and mute them and all that stuff. So uh, the FS API interface is how it exposes those. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about our book, um, the Mastering Free Switch book, which is two years in the making, was just released, and Packet Pub was uh, generous enough to offer these codes that you can have here. They give you a huge discount, and while well, I have the opportunity, um, my co-author Giovanni is right there in the front row. I give him a hand for being doing such a good job on getting the book out the door. OK, um, there's one other uh, interface that it's new, and we haven't done much with it yet, but we're going to be working on it as we go. Um, the JS API, 
which is very similar to FS API only. It speaks JSON objects in and out. So the way where this differs is it's probably meant mostly for the com for a, an application or computer to talk to the API rather because you won't be typing JSON out at the prompt. So you lose that functionality from normal FS API. But if you're doing something like writing a web application, you can make JS APIs uh, that allow you, basically, you can, you know, over in your HTML5, you can make some JSON, formulate it, send it over the JS API over to FreeSwitch. And then in your module, you'll, we have a C JSON library built into the core, and you'll just get an object already parsed that you can walk through in your code and whatnot and do cool things with without having to... Uh, one of the downfalls of the text only thing is you have to parse all the text, and with the JSON API, you already have it parsed, and it's a common format. So we separate it into two different things because whatever you would call a flaw in the FS API is actually also a bonus feature and a lot of other, if you look at it from different angles. So we just separated it into two different ways. So if you really want to have like very parsed communication, you want to use this one. And we have a couple examples in there. Like our status command is implemented both ways. So if you type status at the CLI, you kind of get a textual output, kind of like uptime in Unix. Um, but if you use the, F uh, the JS API of status, every little piece of information that's available in the status is already parsed into an object that you can pull in and then look, react to. Kind of that's there to show you what you can do, and we have a media stats and a channel data function too that you can call on an existing channel that will give you the information as JSON. And the, the FS API and the JS API both gateway to each other, so there's a FS API JS API command that will let you just put the string of text in there so you can gateway to things that aren't implemented the other way yet and vice versa. From the CLI, you could type JS API space and then a hunk of JSON text that you can compose. But that would also allow, if you're using our event socket, it would give you a way to, to use the JS API over that. So the gateway to each other for backward compatibility. So now I want to talk a little about WebRTC and FreeSwitch because uh, today we're having a WebRTC uh, panel up here right before lunch. Um, We've been working on WebRTC since 2013. Um, we kind of waited a year to get into it so that we could have a kind of see the p right path. Even doing that, we've had to redo things a bunch of times because it's a moving target, but it seemed the right, right time to get into it. Um, with our primary goal is just to take what we already had uh, as our media engine and, and make it WebRTC capable. Um, a lot of the things that dealt with dealing SDPs was in our SIP module at the time. Um, and with the WebRTC using SDP, we pulled it into our core so that we could share kind of the same functionality if, with uh, WebRTC type modules and with the SIP one. Um, then once we achieved that, we added SIP over WebSocket support. Um, and that was because there were so many uh, applications of that. Um, we have OnSIB here. They'll talk about that stuff more. I don't want to steal everybody's thunder, so I'm just kind of doing general stuff. Uh, we have a lot of presentations. It basically covers all day, every one of these next three days, and lots of information, and, and you'll learn more about those things. Um, but we also developed Virto, and that was a... Uh, kind of our native WebRTC endpoint. And that allows, uh, allows FreeSwitch to kind of uh, put its own special sauce in the endpoint modules. And uh, go over Virto a little bit. It's an endpoint, like I said, and it it's kind of got an example of a few of the different things that I was talking about. Um, yeah, it's got an FS API interface to generate the dial string um, because Virto uses uh, UUID as keys and they're not like that human understandable. So we have a fun uh, API function that'll translate like the extension they register to into the dial string necessary to call them because with WebSockets, it's kind of like a one-way thing. So when you register, 
you have to be able to look up that connection and call it. So um, with that FS API function, you can just kind of map it into uh, what most people think of, which is just a four digit extension or five digit, whatever you set up, phone number, various things that make sense in a, to call someone. Um, it's got the chat interface um, that allows it to, uh, like when you're in a conference, you can send text to each other and you could, if you're bridged together with SIP, you could kind of translate SIP simple into, uh, you know, HTML based texting. Uh, we have the JS API in there. We have like a JSON store module that's basically kind of a poor man's NoSQL kind of thing where you can dump. There's just a key key value hash that you can put JSON objects in if you want to store them in there. Um, so on the other side of things, we have virto.js, which is JavaScript library. Um, it lightly uses jQuery. It doesn't really depend on it so much as I just use it as a quick way to prototype the functions. Um, we probably don't need it, but it doesn't hurt. If you're just starting with nothing else, at least you've got some kind of toolkit behind you. But really, a lot of people use other stuff. And the jQuery is only there for very menial tasks, like defaulting the arguments to the function prototypes and whatnot. But they don't really, it doesn't depend on it deeply. Um, it's event and callback driven, like most stuff is in JavaScript. Um, basically, you just initialize the library, and you can make uh, multiple simultaneous uh, dialogues from it. And they are uh, then tied to the WebRTC engine. Um, so it provides a signaling mechanism back to FreeSwitch. And as far as the, the WebSocket can be uh, extended to uh, to send different commands if you want to. For instance, uh, in our virtual application, when you call the conference, uh, we use some functionality to report back statistics about the conference, like who's in the conference and whether or not who's talking and who isn't and all that kind of stuff that you can. Uh, so it goes beyond just being setting up calls. It's going to allow you to kind of interact with some of those other things that we leave up to the user. But we do provide some examples. Um, we have two reference implementations. Um, we have the original video demo app, which was basically just something I was jotting down while I was developing the code. It's a kind of like a, just a big control panel for myself to test things, but it is functional to you know, make calls and do conferencing and see all the things you can do. And kind of serves as a documentation, by example. Uh, and then we have kind of like the second generation of that, which is Virtual Communicator, which is made by the Evolux guys who are here at KluCon, and we'll probably be talking about it when it's their turn to speak. But um, both, the, both those things are in tree, and Virtual Communicator is a much more polished uh, with the goal of trying to have a flair of usability on top of it, demonstrating all the features that you can do using some more uh, deeper frameworks and trying harder than I did it. My app is pretty much just like super basic HTML5 stuff, just the functionality and not going for the glitter. So we have both of those, and you kind of can compare how they're both used. Uh, they both use the core library inside the same way, so it's kind of a good contrast. Um, so our latest features, um, right now we can do full transcoding of video uh, BP8, BP9, 263, and 264. Um, and we have working Microsoft Edge and Apple Safari and Chrome and Firefox. So um, where are we? We're going to do a risky run through here. I oh, can't. Dangerous demos is trademarked, so they're not here. So um, this we're going to try and set up here the, the world's first free switch powered video conference to feature simultaneous use of Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Microsoft Edge. And later today, we're going to be doing a WebRTC roundtable where we will have um, some Microsoft engineers using Edge to call in and be on the screen and participate remotely.
So as you can see here, we have this is a uh, virtual communicator, and I'm up here on the stage. We have Brian, and we have the volume off for obvious reasons. Um, Brian is on Safari right now, called into the conference. Uh, we're cheating a little bit because we're using Temesis plugin, but it's already possible, Apple, so hurry up. You might as well do the native version. Uh, we have William over here, and he's on Firefox Nightly. And Kathleen is running Microsoft Edge on a Surface Pro. And all of them are conferenced together at the same time and using all the major browsers. And that's pretty cool, right? Look <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we're going to go back. So what's next? Well, we're about to hit FreeSwitch 1.8. We've been yelling at you to update to 1.6 all this time, but if you haven't done so, now you're two behind because we're on 1.8 now. And we're going to make a whole bunch of drastic changes, so you might want to keep up because the longer you wait, the more painful it is to update. Um, some of the things that are coming around the corner in that version are uh, real-time text and MSRP. Uh, real-time text is being mandated by the FCC, so if you're doing a telecom thing and they tell you, do you have RTT, you better look at free switch 1.8 if that's the fulfillment you need. Uh, we're going to refresh a bunch of the dependency libraries because more advancements have been made in some of the video codecs and those kinds of things, and we don't like to just disturb you with a minor update that changes all that. So. We're going to do a whole bunch of testing and make sure that we have those features uh, working with the newest stuff. So, And the other thing we're going to do is something so awesome, you'll need to come back next year to learn about it. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you so much.